It's uh, truly an honor to be here. Uh, the, I think the title of my talk was uh, Louis and Supernova. And I think it should be clear, well, the, the subtitle or maybe the main title should be Rich and Supernova and the kind of environment that Louis Rich helped create where, where innovation was supported and encouraged and actually, I think, required. And so I, I feel very fortunate to be in kind of this golden era at the time uh, I, I joined Rich's group. He had probably a dozen great projects working in various stages, and it was just, just super. Uh, again, Saul has, has just been a, a fabulous uh, colleague and, and friend. He's, uh, I think, uh, this, I remember uh, it was when Louis got the prize, he called Bob Watt, and he said, we got the prize. And well, those, those aren't Saul-specific words. Uh, he's been hugely magnanimous in trying to share credit wherever he can, and it's just, it's, it's really great. So, gosh, I can't, I guess I, I, this is a little awkward. May I, can I get the microphone so I can, uh, yeah. Is this working? How about this? Hello, hello? Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, um, again, just, you've, you've heard this maybe five times, but, uh, why not again? You know, go after a big goal. But again, it's leaven. Going after the big goal is leavened with what's possible. You know, is, is you know, I mean, like finding dark matter or something. Big, big goal. Extremely, extremely important. I'll explain dark matter later. But it's really, really hard. I think Louis did this delicate and wonderful ballet where he could find a big goal that you could make some progress on within your lifetime. Uh, and again, he had a huge tolerance, huge resilience for mistakes. I mean, we... Uh, and also, patience for people making mistakes uh, after you got louied. And uh, <laughs> we'll explain that later. You know, junk piles were, were uh, again, maybe required. So, uh, and again, he'd always say, you know, we'd be halfway into experiment. Nothing would work. Software would be broken. People were quitting. And uh, Louis would come over and, and console us and say, well, if you really knew how hard it would be before you went into it, you'd never do anything. And... Uh, Again, the disrespect, you know, the damn the torpedoes, damn the peer groups. I think one of the reasons Louis did thrive, at least in, 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 in the 50s, he, he told me once that when he wanted to get the bubble chamber, initial bubble chamber work, which, which developed into, you know, probably multi-hundred million dollar project in today's dollars, he, uh, Ernest Lawrence took him back to Willard Libby, who was uh, the secretary of the Atomic Energy Commission. And after ten, a 10 minute talk, he got the go ahead for this huge, huge project. You know, imagine that in these days. And in fact, Louis never wrote a proposal as far as we could. Okay, and, and again, he, and I think, you know, we could, we could, I think through, you know, through Louis's reputation and attitude and stuff, we were able to attract hugely bright people to his, uh, to his experiments, you know, including Saul. So uh, that's, that's kind of the lessons which the organizers have uh, asked us to, uh, to describe. Now, just, again, what, this has been a, a huge question. I wanted to explain dark matter to you a little bit. It was first suspected when, uh, for example, when Fritz Zwicky at Caltech was measuring galaxy motions, clusters of galaxies. Uh, the way in astronomy, often you measure mass by measuring how fast things are going. So if you see things going real slow, well, it may not much mass. If you see things going, whoa, 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 that means there's a lot of mass. And in fact, Fritz Zwicky thought there was 400 times more mass in these clusters of galaxies than there were in the, in the, in the visible matter. And that, that was kind of the origin of this. Vera Rubin, a woman astronomer, did fantastic work in the 70s with galaxy rotation curves, showed that our own Milky Way, well, the external galaxies had a lot more mass than you could account for in the stars. So that, that was, this is all, you know, starting in the 30s, the dark matter problem. Was, was, was a big deal. And then simulations of, of large-scale structure indicated mass was missing. So, so again, so Rich, Rich you know, assembled this in, in a lot of ways. He, uh, wait, did I go the wrong way? Okay. Okay, so uh, again, Rich realized this was uh, an important goal. He knew the technology was advancing rapidly. Uh, he also, this, and this is the key thing, uh, he learned of work by Robert Wagner, hope I get this right, Rich, uh, 
uh, I asked him recently, that Wagner had, had come up with some ideas of how supernova could be used to measure the geometry, the mass of the universe. And actually what that comes down to is if you know how bright something is at some distance, and, and you, you know, as you know how much energy it's putting out intrinsically, like it's a 100 watt light bulb, then you measure the amount of light landing on your detector, then that's really just related to, to the distance. It's one over the distance squared, in fact. So, so that gave, if, in fact, so if you know how bright things are, which Wagner was suggesting, turns out it was for a different type of supernova than we actually used, then you could, you could start to get, get the geometry mass of the universe. If you know their distance and you know their velocity, then you know, you know will these super distant supernovas stop and then fall back onto Earth like Newton's apple, or will they keep going er for, off forever? So that, that was this, the, uh, the physics behind the system, that, or the, uh, some of the physics. So Rich was going after this. We, am I doing this the wrong way again? My talk is, okay. So, so I, I was hired to help do this, the supernova. Here's our first one. I'll, I'll go over some of this. We, we started in about 1979, found our first one in uh, the galaxy M99. Here's the galaxy about eight days before without the supernova. Here's the galaxy with the supernova. That, that was a huge uh, triumph. Okay, and, and again, this idea was, was not new. Again, Louis didn't invent, invent the bubble chamber, but he, he saw a good idea and he made it work. Similarly, uh, you know, Rich and then uh, Rich and Louis, in fact, knew of the work of Sterling Colgate, a, a very interesting uh, physicist who had gotten a Nike Ajax mi missile mount surplus and, and built his own little telescope. This is when uh, computers were, you know, again, like the size of rooms. So he, he, he couldn't put a computer right there, so he had a microwave link down to the campus and was trying to move this telescope around. And it, it was only, only a mother or slightly uh, enthusiastic astrophysicist could love this telescope. So it, ne it never worked. But again, you know, there may be an analog. So, so Louis was looking at aviation leak and spy technology. I mean, aviation weak and space technology. And what I learned of, of telescopes at Kwajalein Atoll, which is about 2,500 2, miles southwest of Hawaii. These telescopes were used for watching income, you know, when ICBMs would be launched. These guys would take pictures of it. And Louis said, gee, they're only going to be used once a month. Why don't we use them? And so uh, Rich, Rich took me... You know, again, I, I was hired in 1980, and uh, uh, one of my jobs was to help develop it, find the telescopes, find the detectors, et cetera. And um, so uh, we looked at the Kwajalein Atoll telescopes. In fact, that was one of the ones, uh, we looked at over five or so, trying to find the right ones. Uh, we recruited graduate students, engineers, Robbie Smiths and John Yamada. Can you raise your hand, Robbie and John? Okay, there we go. There's John. <laughs> you know, fabulous guys who had worked in, in the, uh, the superconducting magnet, or the, the, you know, the airborne balloons and the, uh, or, you know, the U-2 experiments, et cetera, et cetera. These, these guys are so key to our progress and so essential. Uh, and again, I think, you know, so like what Louis realizes, you need to succeed. So we, again, so we've made pretty good progress on that. Uh, well, this was a challenge, though. Uh, I don't think the problem was nearly as hard as arts, but again, we had to, we had to find automated telescopes because a supernova goes off maybe once every 100, uh, 300 years, so you have to look at a lot of galaxies reliably you know, every night, and uh, you need very sensitive digital cameras which are evolving very quickly in their technology. Uh, then you know, the software, which Colgate had always pointed out was a huge problem, was a huge problem. And, and you have to control the telescope, control the observatory. The dome was always breaking, you know, where the, where the, where the dome goes. Uh, camera control, image processing, discovery, all these were software programs with names like uh, Art had suggested, although different names. You know, so, so it was kind of a, there's kind of a theme here, a Louis-esque theme, lots of data, new technology, important discovery, I think. Uh, so again, in 86, we find our first one. And we found another 25 or so over the next few years. It's really the first, uh, first example of a successful automated supernova search that found a lot. I mean, there were some others that had found a few, but we really got it down. Uh, here's Rich, and again, not to, well, Rich, Rich is still pretty good looking now. <laughs> he's got a lot, he's still got a lot of hair. Uh, this is me at the telescope. This is a telescope we actually used over the, over the hills, Leuchner Observatory. 
you know, one thing actually both Rich and Louis were good at were, you know, supporting, it was mentioned by George, you know, support, they supported my career, you know, all through the state, all at every stage, you know, prizes, awards, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's again, been such a upbeat one. Okay, well then, again, even though we were finding supernova, we couldn't measure the universe with a supernova, you know, a mere, you know, 50 million light years away or so, or 150 million light years away. To really get further, you needed to go more distant. And just as we were succeeding, uh, a, a, a big collaboration uh, found a, a supernova about a third of the way, a quarter of the way to the edge of the universe. And uh, but the, this collaboration, they'd used a, kind of a smallish telescope and a, and, a, and a tiny CCD, 10 pixel by 10 pixel. Actually, not that big, but they, they only could look at a tiny bit of sky. And uh, I was all excited, because this, uh, this is the first group that had made progress on this, on the, on the distant ones. I said, oh, come on. You know, we, we called them up, and I talked to them. Let's, let's collaborate. Let's do things. They said we we're idiots, and uh, forget it, and this would never work. You know, we'd have to, you know, spend uh, millions of dollars on telescopes, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, well, anyway, so, we, I mean, we looked at what they did, and, and of course, we, the, the detectors, charge, couple device detectors were evolving quickly, and we could get a much bigger one. I, I didn't use my own money, although my wife probably thought I did. Uh, uh, we needed big telescopes. Uh, we started off with four meter in Australia, custom optics, you'll see that in a second. Also, getting the data back was tremendous pain. And so, actually, so we formed our team. Heidi Newberg was our first graduate student on the distance search. Warwick Couch, our Australian collaborator. Me, Shane Burns, another great graduate student. And actually, Gersten Goldhaber uh, uh, was, was one of the leaders of the search and, and contributed an awful lot in terms of uh, software, his gravitas, good humors, always had great parties for us, and, and it was just a, a wonderful wonderful person. Uh, so I'm sure Saul will talk a lot more about him in his talk. Anyway, but we had, here's just a picture of the, here's our CCD, the beautiful, beautiful things, uh, thousand by thousand, and, and it's a doer here. And then, uh, oh, damn it, okay. Uh, then here's this optics I'll show you. This is the whole, a light from uh, the four meter mirror of the telescope. All this light was focused on this little optic here, which then went into refracting optics, which, which then could fit it onto the tiny CCD. So we, at Berkeley, we designed and, and, uh, and, and did all this. I'm, I'm doing it, I've been talking too fast. Has anybody understood one, one word I've said? <laughs> no? <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, and here, here's, the, uh, here's the whole rig going into the, this, this is the telescope here. It's, the telescope is, til whoops, I don't want to point him is tilted way over here. This is the so-called top end of the telescope. The primary mirror is back here, and they're just lowering this in, po in position to mount it at the prime focus. But th this is very exciting times. And, and so, well, it was exciting, but it turned out we had a lot of rain. Uh, in fact, it was a particularly bad year at, in Australia. The, also, the quality of the images was not quite good enough. So the collaboration moved to the Isaac Newton Telescope in the Canary Islands. Actually, uh, we started taking data. I was, I was in the Canary Islands taking data when uh, the fire in Oakland was going on. So I called Susan. I say, <clears throat> how's the fire? How, how's it going? She said, well, the whole town is on fire. Well, we're not getting much data here. Maybe I can help. <laughs> this, is called, this is called a really concerned spouse. <laughs> so, anyway, so here, yeah, here, another theme. You know, this is still pretty big. It's two and a half meters. It uh, doesn't look that big here, and f all the light is focused on the prime focus. That's where the optics are often best for, for a telescope. And, and then, you know, I, I got distracted with education, which I'll give one chart on. And it was also clear, you know, Saul was taking more, making more brilliant decisions. So he, he, I mean, I think during much of this work, Rich was the principal investigator, and I was the project scientist. I think, you know, I took more day-to-day -day responsibility. Rich was, was always, you know, getting money, making sure things were working, and, you know, playing a huge leadership role. Um, Rich actually might have made the decision that we start using type 1A supernova. So uh, that, that, was, that, that turned out to be a, in fact, a, that, that changed our whole direction. So anyway, so Saul just did a fantastic job, uh, and he did things I thought were, were not wise. <laughs> He said, well, you know, we're starting to do okay. We had found seven supernovae at the Isaac Newton Telescope. I thought we should keep pounding away on this one telescope. 
It's also, well, look at, we can convince the peer group, you know, the peer community really owns these other telescopes, Kip Peak, Kip telescopes in Arizona, Chile. Said, you know, we, we could probably get time in those. They said, oh, you know, we, uh, peer group doesn't like us. But in fact, we did get time uh, on these, and, and we, he turned the whole system into a, an amazing uh, factory. Well, that's, that's used for another telescope right now. But he had, we found 42 supernova total, counting the Isaac Newton ones. And then that led to the announcement of, of dark energy in this. And, uh, you know, almost a decade and a half later, the uh, Nobel Prize. And there was another team involved, and, I th you know, we beat them to talks and, you know, we, announcements, and, uh, and, they, and they published about the same time as we did. Uh, okay, now, and finally, here's my last view graph. What, how much time do I have, Bob? Okay, well, I don't need that. Anyway, I, I was kind of fascinated by the fact that a lot of children were memorizing science, science factoids and uh, weren't being excited by the, the value and power, power of science. I, I was kind of a Sputnik generation child, and growing up, science and technology is what every, every young person, actually particularly men in those days, would do for their future. So going into science and, uh, science and technology was kind of like falling off a log for me. And I, and, that was, it seemed to me at the time, you know, uh, 15 years ago, even, maybe even, well, somewhat still today, we, our kids were not excited about science. They weren't getting the kind of thrill and, and excited, you know, rigorous science that I knew we were capable of. So the system called Hands-On Universe, what we do is we uh, use a lot of, it's a spin-off of the supernova search. We use a lot of the, the same technology. We use image processing software. We use professional grade Im images, fits images, and we let kids make discoveries. You know, some, some discoveries might have been made before them, but they're, they love the noise in the data, and they, they love the sense of, of going out to space, and we have, we have a, a growing array of automated telescopes around the world that students are using. So I think, you know, this is, I, I probably need to sit down like Louie and think without uh, writing a proposal for an hour sometime, but uh, that's still in my life plan. Uh, and, oh, actually, it's uh, interesting. I think this is the world's first. Uh, a high school teacher, one of our first hands on universe teachers, Hughes Pack, actually helped take some of, the seven, some of the data on the first seven supernova from the Isaac Newton telescope, which, in fact, went into our measurements of omega and lambda. So I, I think this might be one of the first times that a high school teacher helped acquire data that led to a Nobel Prize. So that's kind of cute. And actually, asteroids, which were noise or, or perpetual source of noise in supernova images because they come, they, come, they look great uh, in one image and then they're gone the next, or more, I mean, more appropriately, they're not in one image and they appear in the next, the big bright thing. And uh, so they're, they're a source of uh, pain for the science edge, but actually they're a very source, a great source of interest in science for kids to be able to find, a, find an asteroid. And actually that's, that seems to be taking off pretty, pretty well now. We have students finding hundreds of asteroids and uh, this November, we hope we're going we're gonna to have the first two asteroids named after high schools. There's going to be an asteroid named after a high school in Texas and uh, I think the other in Illinois. And also, we have Japanese students. We're going to have a, a, Fukushima, a Fukushima asteroid named in the memory of the town. So anyway, so this is, I think this is going well now. I, I, wish, I wish Louis here were, would be, well, may, maybe as in spirit, I wish he, he were here to advise me on how to get a little more room to the system. But in spite of my, uh, I think we're, we're not doing too bad. We reached 8,000 teachers around the world in International Year of Astronomy, which makes it one of the leading, it's certainly one of the leading uh, astronomy education programs. I think we can, do, we can do a factor of 100 times better than this. About a million teachers is kind of my goal that we want to reach. But even with these 8,000 teachers, that means Louis indirectly reached easily if you add up the number of years the teacher teaches and the number of kids millions, millions of students through his work. So uh, it's my hope, and I think it's, it's almost true that you know, a bit of Louis is living, living on in these, in these students around the world. So thank you. <laughs>